You're listening to Life in the A-Zone podcast. I'm Peggy Sweeney McDonald, and these are my stories of moving back to my hometown in Louisiana after 36 years to live with my father and mother when she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. These lessons of love, laughter, life, and loss are gifts of living in the A-Zone, and I'm honored to share them with you. If this is your first time here, begin the journey with Episode 1 and go forward. Thank you for joining me today. It has been a week since my mom's hospital stay. I am still running the horrid hospital scene with her standing there with her IV pulled out, covered with blood over and over in my mind. I replay my nasty reaction of yelling at her and then the way she looked at me like a hurt, scolded child. It haunts me day and night. I am so ashamed of my behavior. This is not how a loving daughter should react. How different would it be if I had spoken calmly and with compassion? I am a total failure at this. How could I be so mean? Memories of my mom nursing me from sickness run through my mind. From getting my tonsils out as a child to having nasal surgery my last semester of college, mom was always there. She had a bedside manner that was unmatchable. If I had the flu or a virus, she would set up a TV tray next to me on the sofa, bringing me chicken noodle soup, saltine crackers, 7-Up on crushed ice, and orange sherbet. At night, she would kick Dad out of their bed so that I could sleep by her side. In high school, I had a super high fever once and remember floating up out of my body over the bed and looking down at us from above. At that moment, I felt so much love for my mom, and within seconds, I was back in my body. I'm not sure if it was a dream fueled by the fever or if it was an actual out-of-body experience. But that feeling of being taken care of and loved so fiercely has always stayed with me. While living in Los Angeles, I had several surgeries. Mom insisted on coming out to be by my side. Dad booked flights and they flew out for a week each time so she could help nurse me back to health. She spoiled me and cooked my favorite meals. Irish stew, red beans and rice, roast beef with rice and gravy and served me on a tray as I laid on the sofa convalescing. We watched our favorite movies and had special quality time together. After a few days, if I was up for it, Dad would drop us off at the nail salon for Manny Petties, and then we would have lunch at one of my favorite restaurants. We drove up to Griffith Park, parking at the observatory, then stood at the fence overlooking Los Angeles, a beautiful view from the Hollywood sign to the Pacific Ocean on a clear day. Another time, we drove down the Pacific Coast Highway, marveling at the beauty of the Pacific Ocean on the left and the Santa Monica Mountains on the right, then stopped for lunch at our favorite Malibu restaurant, Joffrey's. We were seated at the edge of the cliff, looking down on the crashing waves. I ordered the ultimate California comfort food, corn and blue crab bisque served with hot rosemary rolls fresh from the oven. The sunshine, the views of the water, the delicious food, and my parents and Jimmy sitting across the table was perfect and all I needed to feel better. I was soon back on my feet and blessed to have my parents with me as I slowly recovered. My mom's laughter filled our condo and brought smiles to my face. Her magic touch and love were healing. Growing up, my mom was never sick. If she got a cold, it would last a day or two and be over. Then in 2002, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. When she found out at the doctor's office, she grabbed her purse, said thank you, and walked out. Where are you going, Mom? My sister Kelly asked her. I'm going to get my nails and hair done, she said, and off she went. Mom believed she would be fine, and she was. She had a hysterectomy the next week. She was lucky, as it was only stage one. She didn't need chemo or radiation, and her cancer never came back. Mom is a cancer survivor and believed she would always be cancer-free because she didn't dwell on it. 
She just knew she would be okay. The power of positive thinking. Unfortunately, positive thinking will not cure my mom's Alzheimer's. It will only help us with getting through each tough day. I try to remember that. Since I left the hospital last week, I haven't had the courage to go see my mom at memory care. What if she remembers my outburst? What if she turns away from me? My dad and sisters have visited her this last week and report she's not as weak as she was. She's even eating a bit. I'm not sure what a bit means. A bite, two bites, a sip of protein drink, a spoonful of yogurt, a sip of apple juice. I need to go see mom today. I feel ashamed I haven't gone to visit her, I tell Jimmy. I understand. Do you want me to go with you? He asks. Jimmy knows how much I've been struggling as he has found me crying all week long. No, I'll be okay. Okay is my emotional temperature if anyone asks me how I'm doing with all of this. I'm lukewarm. I feel like I've lost all passion for life. I smile because that's what I was taught to do. When we were very young, my mom had a friend come over and she tried to talk to us. We were very shy and didn't say anything. After her friend left, my mom sat us down and told us that if we didn't have anything to say to her friends, then we just needed to smile. The Sweeney smile was born. We all have these big, sincere smiles and always take great pictures. We have trained our husbands how to smile for the perfect family pictures. The grandkids learn by example. They didn't have a choice. My dear friend Carmen loves to goof on us whenever we take pictures. Do the Sweeney smile, she says to everyone else in the picture. Carmen learned fast. The Sweeney smile has helped me survive many uncomfortable situations and probably got me in some trouble too. Living in New York, I learned to curtail the smile after several strangers started following me on the street because I had innocently smiled at them. These days, I definitely hide behind my smile. If I smile, everything is okay, right? My family loves pictures. We constantly annoy our husbands, the kids, and friends with the constant posing and snapping pictures. My parents' house is filled with framed pictures, and the living room cabinets are stocked with countless photo albums. There are endless plastic bins of photos in their paper envelopes from the days where we printed rolls of film. Most of the pictures have my mom's writing on the back of the pictures. She would write a cute caption to go along with the pictures with the place, date, and the ages of everyone. She adored her photos and taught us to love them too. Taking photos is a Sweeney family hobby. For the last ten years, we have graduated to printed photo books. My sisters Shannon and Kelly are the queens of organizing them and creating beautiful hardback books for special occasions. Some of these photo books sit on my mom's nightstand at Memory Care. She used to spend hours looking at these at home, but now she only looks at them when one of us visits and opens the photo books to show her the pictures. She loses interest fast, and this puts another knife into our hearts. It's just one more thing that has changed, one more thing to remind us that she isn't the mother we knew. Add it to the lost and found list. The lost list gets longer, but we will never be able to check off found. All the beautiful qualities of our mother are fading away. My favorite photo book is the one from her seventy-fifth surprise birthday in New Orleans. It sits on the coffee table at home. We didn't bring it to her memory care apartment. I should bring it today. Maybe it will spark better memories for Mom. Maybe it will spark better memories for me. I grab it off the coffee table and then walk out the door. Driving across town, I pray, "Please, God, give me the strength to get through this visit with my mom. Please let her be happy to see me. Please let her recognize me. Please help her eat today. Please help her talk. Please don't let her die. We aren't ready. I'm not ready." As I enter the memory care, Mom is sitting with a group of Alzheimer's patients around a table. 
Dina, who's one of my favorite caretakers, plays music on her cell phone, singing along to oldies but goodies. Dina stands and gives me a big hug. I adore her, and Mom does too. Her bright energy is a shot in the arm. Hi, Mom. How are you today? I smile, and she smiles back. She seems happy to see me. Maybe she's forgotten the hospital incident. I sure hope so, as I want to put it far, far behind me. I want those memories to be wiped away forever. Dina begins playing Whitney Houston's "I Will Always Love You." I pull Mom up, and we dance while I sing the song to her. Well, I dance. She stands there, and I swing her arms and sing to her. The words of the song make me cry. Mom isn't singing with me any more. But she does lamely mouth the words, "I will always love you," and even laughs a bit. Dina grabs my phone and videotapes it. Mom gets tired quickly, and I sit her back down. Our dance lasted only about thirty seconds, but I will cherish the moment, and I am grateful for the video. It is the dance of Alzheimer's. I wonder if this will be the last time I will dance with my mom. Thanks, Dina. I say as she hands me the phone. You're gonna want to keep that video. She replies and smiles at me. The caretakers begin moving the patients into the dining room for dinner, and they place Mom in the kitchen area at a table. I follow and sit next to her. We are still monitoring her eating. Dina tells me. Good. Thank you so much. I sit with Mom and I help her feed her yogurt and hold a protein drink up to her mouth. She takes a few bites and then a few sips. This is the best we can do today. Mom doesn't talk. The caretakers buzz around Mom. They are wonderful, warm and fuzzy, and this brings me so much comfort. Mom, do you want to go to your room? She shakes her head yes, and I help her up, and we walk slowly down the hall to her room. She sits in her wingback chair, and I show her the photos in the picture book. Look, Mom, this was your seventy-fifth birthday. Remember when we surprised you at the hotel in New Orleans? I flip through the pages and she looks at a few pages, then just stares away. I notice she has written in the back of the photo book. I will bring it home and read it later. I lean it against my purse on the kitchenette counter and bustle around organizing her outfits, straightening her drawers. I grab a handful of the now stale goldfish snacks. Mindless goldfish eating. I'm not even hungry, but I grab another handful. The little solar-operated red plastic bird that we bought at the dollar store last year is still on her nightstand. It isn't getting enough light, so the wings are lifeless, just like my mom. I move the bird to the window, and in a few seconds, it begins flapping its wings. Look, mom, your bird is trying to fly. She just looks at me. I remember how tickled she used to get when we had the bird on the window sill of the kitchen. I feel like the bird, flapping my wings and going nowhere as I trudge through this visit. I don't know if Mom understands what I'm saying or what I'm talking about. It's painful. I turn the TV on and Jeopardy is playing. She stares at the TV and taps the top of her mouth with her fingers. It's heartbreaking. Fifteen minutes feels like two hours. Crystal, the nurse, comes in to give her her nightly meds. I watch as she crushes Mom's pills and mixes them into pudding in a small cup. She walks over and spoons the pudding into Mom's mouth. Swallow it, Miss Sherry, she says, and my mom closes her mouth and miraculously swallows it. Good girl, Mom. I think her nightly caretakers will soon be coming to prepare her for bed, so I try to figure out my exit. I use her bathroom before I go and notice a large box of adult diapers on the bathroom counter. Since the hospital stay last week, Mom is wearing these now. A new constant. I can't imagine how humiliating it is for her, or maybe now she just thinks it's normal. Mom, I need to leave. I have to fix dinner for Dad and Jimmy. Oh, you're leaving? Yes, Mom. She reaches for me to help her stand. This is the first thing she has said to me since I arrived, and she's alert for this moment. Life has come back to her. 
We walk out of the room holding hands and slowly go down the hall. She stops at a living area halfway down the hall and walks over to a chair in the corner. She sits and puts her legs up on the hassock, lays her head back, and closes her eyes. She looks tired. My precious little mama is so small in this big armchair. Goodbye, Mom. I love you. I'll see you tomorrow. And I lean down to kiss her cheek. Bye, she says with her eyes still closed. I turn to leave and then look back to look at her one more time. Her eyes are now open and she is looking at me, really looking at me. For that moment, I feel like my mom is seeing me for the first time in years. Don't forget how good you are, she tells me. Thank you, Mom, I say, choking back tears. She closes her eyes and I turn and walk away, stunned. Don't forget how good you are. Those six precious words are exactly what I needed to hear today. Where did this come from? My mom has never said this to me before. These words of wisdom from my mom seem to come from heaven above. It's as if God was telling her to tell me what I needed to hear to ease my pain. These words wiped out the movie in my mind of that horrible hospital nightmare. This beautiful moment could be the new movie in my mind. I can replace it and I can run it over and over and over again. Don't forget how good you are. In these simple words, I know she has forgiven me and is trying to wash away my sadness. Don't forget how good you are. The pat on my back that I needed in this very moment. In this moment, these words will erase all of the regrets, all of the bad times, and all of the sad times. I need to hold on to this. My mom still loves me. She knows that I've been with her, and she knows that I will stay with her until her last breath. That night at dinner, I tell Dad and Jimmy what happened. They smile, knowing I needed the validation. After dinner, I pull out the picture book to read the back inside cover filled with my mother's beautiful handwriting. Dad sits with me in the living room, and I read it out loud. This is my mom's story of her seventy-fifth birthday in her words. Friday and Saturday, October fifth and sixth, two thousand eleven. My seventy-fifth birthday was a real surprise. Miles said he was taking me to New Orleans, and we would stay at a new hotel close to the French Quarter. We arrived at three o'clock and went to our room. Miles went down to get us a cocktail. He came back and told me no cocktail service until later. We waited and watched a little TV, and then went downstairs to the lounge. Still no drinks yet, but we talked to some of the people sitting next to us. I then suggested we just walk to the French Quarter and buy our own drinks and snacks. There's a bar at every corner. It is the French Quarter, right? Question mark. Question mark. Question mark. Miles then told me he had a business call to make and was gone for a little while. Then he came back and told me only thirty minutes before the happy hour. He said the snacks were out and we could go help ourselves. He would be right back and left again. I started to get suspicious and wondered what was going on. Sure enough, he came back and asked me what I would like to drink. I told him a Bloody Mary. Then I saw him walking back with our drinks and a big smile on his face. I smiled at him, and then I heard at the entrance of the hotel people singing "Happy Birthday to You." It was my four daughters who had left their jobs early to come to New Orleans and celebrate with Miles and me. I was very surprised and felt like laughing and crying at the same time. We had drinks, then walked to the French Quarter. We stopped and gambled a while at the casino, and then went to eat at the Redfish Grill. We had a delicious meal, and then went to Pat O'Brien's. The piano bar was crowded, so we sat outside on the patio. We had a great time together. We laughed and talked, and it couldn't have been any better celebrating my birthday with my family, who I love very much. 
The next day, we went for beignets at Café du Monde for breakfast, then had a delicious late lunch at Commander's Palace before driving back home to Baton Rouge. I really appreciated all of my surprises. It will be a birthday I will treasure, even though I turned 75. Thank you to my precious husband for planning this surprise with my wonderful daughters. I am a very proud mother of all four of my girls. You are the best, and I love all of you very much. I hope we can do this again in the future. Love, hugs, and kisses, Mom. Although we were never able to plan another surprise birthday weekend with just Mom, Dad, and my sisters, we can cherish the memories because we have the book filled with 140 pictures from the birthday weekend and my mom's beautiful story in the back of the book describing how much it meant to her and how much we mean to her. As my mom's life winds down, what do I need to tell her before she's gone? I must tell her every time how much I love her and thank her for all of her life lessons. I need to tell her, Mom, don't forget how good you are. Thank you for joining me for Life in the A-Zone. Look for new episodes each Wednesday. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and follow on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To join my mailing list, go to lifeinthea-zone.com and check out my best-selling book, Meanwhile, back at Café du Monde, Life Stories About Food, at Amazon and Barnes & Noble.